welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I am your host tonight, Joe, and with me is Aaron and Christian. And um, we've got so much stuff to talk about. I just got back from Mil- Maker Fair Milwaukee like an hour ago. And I'm still kind of buzzing with all of that, but we also have tons of maker news and some great maker topics uh, tonight. We're going to need to be talking about why you should join a makerspace, even if you have your own workshop. So uh, with that, what are you guys drinking tonight? Uh, I uh, It's actually a really big night for me. <laughs> this is the the last of that Kirkland vodka. Yay! Uh, it is now gone. Uh, End of an era. Finally. <laughs> yes, so next week I'll probably get some new liquor. Are you going to get a new six-gallon jug of Kirkland vodka? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to get some sort of scotch because I miss it. Nice. Uh, and I'm too go. cheap to buy more liquor when I have liquor here. <laughs> <laughs> Always Go back to the classic. Right. Scotch is always a good one. Yep. <laughs> um, I am so um, I'm actually uh, trying to find a blackberry cider that me and Joe had at oh, yes. uh, Pizza Works. And so I went out to a uh, local Hy-Vee and I found something that's kind of close. It's not there yet, but it's really good. It's called a Crown Valley Blackberry Cider. Uh, and so I will be enjoying that tonight. Nice. And I'm on one of my old fallbacks, which is uh, the Rogue Dead Guy Ale, which is just great. And I'm really excited because in the back of my truck, I have the new Glarus sampler pack that I brought back from Maker Fair. And uh, I'm excited to dive into that in the coming episodes. So- <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So with that, um, Aaron, you're going to kind of lead the way with Maker News tonight because so much of this is in your realm until we jump into Maker Fair Milwaukee. So. All right. So the first one that I had found um, comes from Hackaday. There's a Reddit thread on someone who found a way to add analog touch to mechanical keyboard switches. Um, he had so, figured out... No, oh, go ahead. So like pressing and getting force feedback so being able to read how how far down you press the key oh yeah it's very clever oh so in all these cherry uh switches these mechanical switches you know there's little metal springs in there yeah they sound like this yeah (laughs) they sound like this (laughs) The sound so, of my people. <laughs> yes. So what is inside, you know, all these switches are little springs that help bring the key cap back up. But what is a spring other than a coil of wire, which <laughs> causes inductance? Right. So what this guy figured out was he could add an uh, inductance to digital converter. And you could read, you could essentially, as the spring gets compressed, um, I forget if that increases the, I think that, decreases the conduct the inductance when it's compressed mm, it increase it increases yeah. when it stretches out yeah yeah so based on reading that you can determine how far down the key is pressed and that could be useful for a lot of interesting applications like for um, gaming yeah you could maybe peek around a corner by just partially pushing down your key instead of fully running out to the left or you know just a lot of weird applications So Hmm. um, all it is is adding a little um, spiral trace underneath the actual mechanical switch and then running that that trace into the inductance sensor. So um, the guy just has a proof of concept, but it works really well. And I just thought that was a really neat thing to share here. That was very cool. I I can think of all kinds of fun ways to use that. Yeah. So everything is laid out in that in that thread, too, um, as far as uh, circuits and whatnot. Huh. Yeah, that's a that's a really cool way of like using something that has been out for a while and making it something new. That's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. There is an interesting article. Um, it was a, it, it's not very close to making in general, but it's in, it's uh, important to open source. It's influential. And, yes, and it's in in uh, 
response to Linux's um, change to a code of conduct away from the code of conflict. Um, the title is called Can You Take Back Open Source Code? And without getting too much into the boring legal details, um, the Linux kernel is licensed under the GPL version 2 license. Right. Inside the version 2 license, there is a clause which says... If the project changes the terms for which the code is used or how the product is run, the um, contributor of the code still maintains copyright of the code they contribute. And they could essentially then revoke essentially the um, the permissive rights that the project holders get to their code. Yep. So a lot of developers really are angry about the abrupt change to the code of conduct and specifically this code of conduct. There's a lot of, there's a lot of different code of conducts and a lot of people weren't huge fans of the specific one they chose because a lot of the wording is very politically charged. Yes. And, um, mm. from, from my understanding, there's a lot better code of conducts that aren't like that. Well, and the so, author is fairly politically charged as well. From what I hear, she is very politically charged. Yes. So, but you know, neither here nor there. Um, I thought it's a really interesting, thought-provoking article. Um, that'll also be in the show notes. Um, I didn't want to get too deep into that, but it, it's just an interesting thing well, to get your, the, get your brain going. The biggest thing that it has to influence, without getting too deep into it, is this could cause some fairly damaging legal precedents for the open source community, right? Like, mm -hmm. as somebody who fought tooth and nail to get open source software into a large corporation... Uh, this has me very worried for the future of open source in corporations like that. Yeah, so. I mean, just imagine if they did go through with this and they managed to like actually revoke the rights to that code. What happens to all of the Linux kernels out that are everywhere? I mean, Linux is now everywhere. It's in embedded devices. It's on. It's running pretty much all of the cloud servers. Yes. Like, I it so. hurts my brain just thinking about what that could do so for for people that are listening to this and thinking i don't use linux this will never affect me hey netflix runs on linux let's just let that sink in yeah. for a second <laughs> like the entirety of google runs Am on linux the entirety of amazon runs yeah. on linux amazon runs on linux last time amazon yes. went down everything went down <laughs> so it's uh it's a bit. Microsoft mostly runs on Linux. <laughs> yeah. Do you think Microsoft yeah. runs all their Azure platforms on Windows Server licenses? Nope. Nope. <laughs> That's why they work. All right. Well, so and, exactly. And, <laughs> in fun, in funner open source news, System seventy six is teasing a new open source computer. Yes. Yes. Mm. So this is actually super interesting. Um, for those who don't know who seventy six System seventy six is, they are a an open source software slash uh, computer reseller. So they take these laptops and desktops from Chinese wholesalers, and they configure and make sure that they work one hundred percent with Linux. Yeah. And they they have their own like you know um, test suite and tool chain, so they can actually. You know, they actually have their own uh, software repos that they, um, they have get their added. Own, they have their own OS now, which is yeah, Pop, um, Pop OS. Past, yep, yep. In the past year, they came out with Pop OS, which is um, based on Ubuntu, but has uh, all of System 76's little tweaks and changes to the Ubuntu system. I and believe there, I believe it's stock GNOME with some changes. No, it's for the desktop. It's still um, it's still Ubuntu GNOME. Uh, so it still has like the dock and everything, but they oh, okay. remove all the Ubuntu spyware. Nice. So I, I had to do that, and I, I'm still not a huge fan of needing to do that. Yeah, and the uh, my favorite part of it was when I when I booted it up, it had me fill out all my online account information that like I want to sync. So uh, my laptop that's running Pop right now automatically syncs my next cloud automatically syncs my google drive and automatically syncs all of my email into their bundled email app and all i had to do was just fill out like the couple forms with the login info i didn't have to go through setting up web dev for my next cloud or oh, nice. like doing all all the in the weeds stuff that you normally have to do to do that stuff 
it was just like part of the OS setup, which took 10 minutes yeah. and was uh, so super user friendly. No, that's awesome. Yeah. So bottom line, System76 is a great player in the Linux ecosystem, specifically yes. Linux for the Linux desktop ecosystem. Yep. Um, but uh, this past week, they uh, they um, started a new like I want to call it like a teaser campaign. Yeah. For a brand new open source computer, which has me very much intrigued because they pretty much already have you know I'm not gonna say the most open source computer you can get, but fairly close. Pretty um, close. Besides besides getting to like the Libre boot stuff. Yeah. When I worked Anyways, for Lulzbot, yeah. all we used was System76. Nice. So that says a lot. They, they, mm. Yeah, that, that they were okay with it. And, and they just got Lulzbot's uh, marketing director. He just moved to System76. So, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, they, they just got a really new, awesome marketing dude. So I'm excited for him. Do you think he was a part yeah. of this campaign or... Before, um maybe he came on i mean he he's been a part of all of the the really corny lulzbot campaigns the very lulzy ones uh, <laughs> so like I, the nano nozzle <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he was part of that um but like the uh mad scientists bouncing the lulzbots around while they're printing he was you know part of that and mm. um lots of really good stuff so yeah. So back to the news article. Yep. <laughs> so they're teasing a new open source computer. It'll be available for pre-order next month. Um, but over the, the course of the next couple weeks, they're actually releasing a bunch of animated shorts. Which, um, sh yeah, I see your reaction, Christian. It is very All interesting. Right. So a series of animated shorts um, that follow um, an engineer called Tenzin. And his robot companion called Zoe, which is also the name of the robot from the Pop! OS um, operating system. But okay. it's following Tenzin's journey to repair his robot that came back from mission all broken. And it's called Thelios is the name of this project. And that's the name of the, the computer that's coming out. But the idea is that these animated shorts will um, demonstrate the importance of open source in, in how it um, affects us in our everyday lives and how closed source can affect us in our everyday lives. And so far, they only have the first one, which is kind of sets up the plot. Um, I'm, I'm eagerly anticipating the next ones to see where they go with this. But the cool thing is that they contracted all of this out to a marketing company to you know handle all the, the, um, the video and the voiceovers and all that stuff. But that company as a 100% open source marketing company. So everything in the, in the shorts were written in Blender. They used um, Krita for uh, um, graphic stuff. All the, you know, the graphics, the animation, the artwork, the music, all done with open source software. Oh, okay. So I thought, I thought that was incredibly awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm so, definitely going to have to check this out. So I'm super psyched about this, but I also read another article because they were all System76 was actually at the Open Hardware Summit, and they had the computer there, and they took very good care in nobody taking pictures of it. But from what I read, it's for sure a desktop. There's wood involved, hmm. and some cathode lighting, hmm. um, but it's not Risk V based, which was kind of what I was hoping for when they said open source desktop because otherwise what's going to be what's going to be different you know? um they have teased this in the past if you watch some of uh Brian Lunduke's past episodes uh, mm -hmm. I I I think I know where they're going with this and I'm I'm really excited about it it's cuz they were working on an open source case design and mm -hmm. like weird cooling methods and all of that. So, uh, but the idea was that you could like route all of this out on a CNC router and have 3d printed components and do all this cool mm. stuff. I so, see. um, yeah. Cause the article did say it is x86 based. Yeah. So it's still probably Intel or AMD or anything, but I'm sure it is saying 
is that you could absolutely come to your local makerspace and potentially have a whole new machine. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> if so that actually going makes me feel a lot better. Yeah, that that makes me feel a little bit better about the whole thing. I'm like, what's going to be different than what everything else than is? Just listing out your components. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here's my bomb open sourced <laughs> right <laughs> all right what else do we have uh, uh the open source hardware association revealed a new simplified certification process um i didn't even bother reading this one but the open source um hardware association um or osha no not osha oshwa oshwa yeah um, they're the or the they're they are the association if you want to get an official open hardware certification for your project. So if you have some sort of hardware project and you want to open source it, um, you could just put under any, any sort of license, but um, it's kind of like copyright, like getting, getting like patents or copyrights, but through an open source, I don't know, process. And it's still, everything is still open source, but there's actually an official body that goes through it. Make sure it's, you know, good. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if they make sure it's original or anything, but. They essentially list it down as um, this person's project is under this license and they, they have met these criteria for like, you know, source code, designs, blueprints, CAD designs, whatever. Um, once they, If you pass all that, then they give you an official certification. You get like a certification number or whatever. But they apparently have now improved it. So it's, you know, it's, it's more accessible. And I thought that'd be something our listeners would be interested in. So... I don't want to get yeah. too much into it. Yeah. No, very cool. Um, that's it for me as far as news. Uh, Joe, you want to talk a bit about Maker Fair? Yeah. Uh, I will try not to, t to ramble on uh, too long. So um, this was my first experience at a Maker Fair as an attendee. I've been going to uh, maker fairs and we've been hosting our own um, non-branded maker fair. It's called Midwest Maker Fest for uh, the last four years. And I've been doing these for seven now. And, um, you know, I always thought they were super cool, but I never really got how awesome they were um, from the point of an attendee. And it, so that that's kind of always escaped me. I've never really even walked around our fair other than just checking on people and making sure they don't need bottles of water or like, you know, a power yeah. strip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done about right. three of our events now, and it's always been as a uh, an exhibitor. Yeah. And but the past three Maker Fests, I, I barely walked around at all. Yeah. But the uh, the experience of going as an attendee and uh, experiencing it with my nine year old uh was just absolutely incredible and it, there were a couple really key things that i thought were super fun um they had an entire area that was about a quarter of the exhibit hall and the exhibit hall was uh huge it was probably one and a half maybe twice as big as the exhibit hall that we have midwest maker fest in which is um oh it's 100 feet by 50 feet uh, however many square feet that is. I can't do math because it's been a really long weekend. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a quarter of that uh, was all dark and it was all exhibits built out of light. And they had um, like 50 foot tall projection mapping exhibits. Um, they had a some really, really neat light installations that were... Uh, done by the guy that runs um maker fair in milwaukee uh which is his name's uh pete Perdell. he's one of the guys from the milwaukee makerspace um and then they had massive tesla coils and haha <laughs> nice they were <laughs> awesome like to see transformers from like a power substation just hanging out on the floor and like <laughs> you can you can hear them charging up as before Jeez. they charge the tesla coil that was neat and then the tesla coils arcs were so loud 
um, you know, I was covering my ears and I don't cover my ears for loud noises. It, it was very cool. And then they had the musical Tesla coil thing, but they were like shocking a knight in armor. And I got some really hmm. good pictures of that. Uh, we'll put some links to those in the show notes. Um, but it, that was super fun. And um, I'm trying to think of all the exhibits that really like blew me away. Uh, there was one guy that had a really amazing ceramic printer. And I did an interview with him, so I'm not going to dive too deep into that. But um, his ceramic printer design was very simple. And uh, his approach was very different from some of the others that I've seen. And, um, you know, his, his, uh, his method was very like, uh, kiss method, keep it, keep it stupid, simple or simple, stupid, depending on who you're yelling at. Um, but it was, uh, very technically interesting. It, there were some he of the, a ro- huh? he's a robot arm, right? Yeah. So that one was a robot arm, but his normal one is a, uh, 18 by 18 by 18, inch cartesian printer uh where the bed moves like a mill so the bed moves in the x and the y direction and then he's Uh, got a stationary arm to lift the syringe and the syringe is uh, like two ish foot long by two inch diameter uh piece of polycarbonate tube and uh he's got a, a screw driven axis that compresses the plunger for the syringe and what i thought was really neat about that was he wasn't software controlling the extrusion um it was simply a uh self-built um motor controller that used a potentiometer to turn the extrusion rate up or turn the extrusion rate down and once he gets it dialed in he keeps his traverse rate constant uh with as little acceleration as possible and that's how he gets really amazingly good prints. Um, and uh, yeah, so kind of blew my mind for a second. Yeah, it's so simple. <laughs> um, but we had a really good 15 minute interview uh, that I really enjoyed doing. And um, we'll dive into that more. Uh, but, you know, there were uh, the main things that really like drove me to like what maker fairs are for was like they had a simple display that was just um, a board with holes in it, like pre-drilled pilot holes and bends of screws. And there were kids lining up to put screws in the holes. So simple, <laughs> but like so effective for what we're trying to do uh, as, um, you know, STEM or STEAM educators or like inspirational people. It was so effective. I had to drag my daughter away from that. She put oh, like man. 15 screws and I'm like, come on, I got to drill at home. Let's go do some other things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and then she always reminds me, but you don't let me touch your tools. And I'm like, and that's right. Maybe I'll have to get your own. Like, And I totally might. Um, and then there was another one. Uh, that was a workshop. It was a paid workshop. You had to pay three or five dollars to get into it, but it was just a uh, room set up with fences and it was full of fabric scraps and sewing machines and glue guns and scissors. And there was one volunteer, so super low maintenance. And there was like 15 girls in there just like making stuff making pillows there was one girl that was making a bodysuit out of her brother she was like sewing him into <laughs> it. it it was so fun um and then they had a workshop where you built your own race car uh for the nerdy derby which is like the pinewood derby but super low tech like we the wheels we had to choose from looked like old wheels from toy cars or poker chips and they were definitely poker ah. chips and <laughs> nice. uh, the tracks were super fun. They were made out of uh, CNC'd out plywood. Um, I got some good videos. Uh, Nora's car did awesome. Again, like three volunteers running this booth, like 30 people making cars. And it was super awesome. Um, yeah, the whole event was, was great. Uh, we spent like 15 hours at the event between the two days. And uh, nice. I'm not sure we did everything. It, it was <laughs> it was really really fun. So 
Nice. Uh, definitely have a lot of ideas for our Maker Fest and um, very, very inspired. Man, I didn't even talk about the outside. The outside, they had the Power Wheels Racing um, or Power Racing event, uh, which was super fun to watch. They had a fire breathing dragon that was giant and metal. Um, they had, oh, by the way, they have all the same restrictions we do for Maker Fest. What? All of them. Yep. So, so they just break them? Nope. Nope. They just work within the rules. It's fine. Um, <laughs> and then we'll have to go into that a lot more. <laughs> um and then uh they had blacksmithing outside which was awesome they had a an ornithocopter which is like looks like a da, a da vinci <laughs> flying machine it was amazing yeah. it was running off of a hit and miss engine and every time i walked by some kid was like i don't trust that thing to blow up and the, <laughs> everyone was like neither do we <laughs> what's a hit and miss engine um, it is a single cylinder engine that every rotation either fires or doesn't. It's like every oh other rotation. <laughs> um, they're really, really common for uh, like grain, um, grain crushing machines on farms and like running farm equipment and stuff. And in, in like, you know, early 1900s, they're super common. There's a whole uh, like community of old farmer dudes that are super dedicated to restoring them and building new ones. They're really neat. That, that's so interesting. I never heard of that. Huh. Yeah, Liz's grandpa was, uh, was super into them and, uh, um, yeah, they were, they were fun to look at, but interesting. Yeah. And then it was fun for me as a makerspace organizer to just go around and talk to other people that ran makerspaces and, like pick the brains of other people that ran maker fairs and maker fests. I, I got to meet the head of the Orlando maker fair. Um, some of the people who organize Bay area and New York, um, and, and you know, just kind of like commiserate and, uh, share the pains of being an event organizer and a makerspace organizer and the joys. So, um, it's a really good time to come back and talk about the topic that we're talking about tonight, which is, why should we join a makerspace when we already have tools? Um, because, you know, I, I spent the last two nights talking to all the people that um, are really are, are just super passionate about the whole thing. So that's all I got. Um, I will post. Um, I'll put all my pictures and videos and stuff into a public uh, photo album and we'll post them in the show notes so you guys can see Maker Fair. So. Sweet. So speaking of the pains of organizing a makerspace, we have uh, officer elections coming up. We do. Makerspace. Yeah, that was actually one of the things I talked to people about. And, um, you know, this year we have a good portion of our um, makerspace directors stepping down that have been directors since the very beginning of River City Labs. And... Um, we are trying something new this year where we are having all of those officers stay on board for an extra two months while the new officers come online. So we can kind of like change hands and um, you know, help everyone when come online and make sure it's a really nice, smooth transition. And I, I was talking to uh, guys from pumping station one, which is a big maker space in Chicago and uh, Level 1 Makerspace, which is a really great makerspace in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, we were talking about officer burnout and why we would have so many directors step down. And huh. um, they, were, they were... Why would you do that to me, Joe? Well, <laughs> why, would you, why would you let over half the directors just walk out on me? It's not that we're walking out on you. It's the right time. No, I, I understand. I'm so, just joking. For those that don't know, um, we just moved into a brand new space. This is our our third move as an organization. The organization is about four years old. Um, mm -hmm. It's five years old in November. If you go from the first day we all met and started planning, uh, which was November 22nd. But um, five years old is a critical point for makerspaces. Because two things happen. Usually the same directors stay directors for the first five years. So it becomes very 
personalized to those directors and not necessarily to the membership. And it's old enough now that we have maker amnesia where we've got enough new people that weren't there for the beginning that are super passionate and have all these ideas that we've already tried <laughs> and failed or they worked. And um, usually it's they failed and we are not doing them anymore. And everyone's like, well, why aren't you doing it this way? And we're like, well, here's why. Um, but at five years, the organization's changed enough that maybe we need to try those things again. Um, I've always hated uh, trying to introduce ideas to like old guys that have been doing things for 20 years. And they're like, ah, we, we did that back in the eighties and it didn't work. <laughs> and it's like, you didn't think it changed in 30 years, dude. We've been making tractors <laughs> the same way for the past 90 years. And, and that's been, the problem. And this is how we've gotten this far. And we're going to get <laughs> even farther the next 90 years doing the exact same thing. Yeah. So it's all cyclical. It's going to come back around. <laughs> Make, <laughs> maker spaces aren't cyclical. Uh, if we've learned anything in the like 15 years that maker spaces have been around or actually, wow, it's 20, like 20 years. Um, you know, they're not cyclical and things change and you do need to try things again. So now's the time. Uh, we've moved into a brand new space and then a month later, officer elections happen. And, you know, now the officers that are coming in can come in and we, we can start fresh. We can have, uh, new declarations and build new, community guidelines and and all of the things that we need as a makerspace we can do now um, like a wiki like a wiki that somebody needs to put links to other than his username um, yeah you know a prominent officer already changed his slack username to the wiki's url to make sure that maybe the, it was everywhere maybe the wiki should be publicly linked somewhere you know so our listeners can find it and be like oh that wiki's got some great ideas, like how to turn a POS terminal into a CNC computer. <laughs> Did you ever think of that? <laughs> Bet you didn't. I uh, mean, it is public. <laughs> but, but <laughs> how, we should get on our website, how though. How are people going to find it? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's why we're changing officers that's why we're changing so many officer positions. They've stagnated. The officers that we have are just so burnt out. They're not even, they're not even trying. Some of them, they're just like, I'm going to go coach football. <laughs> Maker spaces. And that's the wrong attitude. We, we need, we need super passionate people and we've got a ton of them and it's their time. So, yep. and we're going to give them two months of, uh, of backlog of frustration and, all we'll get them all jaded for you before we step down fully <laughs> perfect i like Just my new officers should be i like my new officers pre-jaded before they come in right but you know <laughs> anyway or i was going somewhere with all this i was telling the guys from these other super established and fairly large maker spaces about this and they all went huh that's a good idea maybe we should do that i haven't we thought of that and I'm like all right, maybe we're onto something. Maybe we're trying something new that might work and we can like set a precedent and you know, do, do the things and share the ideas, but, or maybe we're idiots and this is a terrible idea <laughs> and it's just going to end, end, end up in frustration for everybody. You're going to have to tell me what those ideas were. Cause I'm curious of what they thought. Oh, they just, they, they were, they were excited that we were like transitioning our officers instead of just, being like, I'm out. Oh, that. Here's the keys to the place. It's on no, yeah, fire it's already. <laughs> right. Fire extinguishers on the wall. Well, what? Not sure it's Originally, charged. like what, a couple of years ago, we would switch officers right before Maker Fest, right? Yes. Yeah. And so you get these brand new officers that now need to help with. Yeah, organize this our our largest event of the year. Yeah, we would. Maker <laughs> Fest is the beginning of August, and officer elections were at the end of June. So they would have one month to figure out how to be a makerspace officer and organize a five thousand person event. It was bad. So we we fixed it. We're done doing that, and 
you know, now we're yeah. now we're even including a transition period. So hopefully, hopefully it helps. But talking about, you know, speaking of transition phases, Joe, why would somebody join a makerspace <laughs> when they already have a personal workshop? What a great segue. Community I'm working on it. I'm working on it. All right. Right. <laughs> so that's it, it's hard because especially because we live in the midwest where everybody has a workshop right like land's cheap here everybody's got a giant garage and a table saw in it so why and this is like a a super common question we get everywhere we go people are like well i've already got a prusa or i've got a i've got my table I, saw i call it prusa it's like oh yeah a printer right yeah 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 I've already got he, a 3D is. printer. <laughs> Why should I join your makerspace? <laughs> and it's 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 everything else. Makerspaces aren't the sum of their tools, right? Where the it's the sum of their people, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, anybody can buy tools, and anybody can you know go to a job shop and use a tool. You know, I, I think that, that's not true. <laughs> well, whatever, you know. <laughs> The the thing that really makes makerspaces stand out are the people. Yes. And I feel like if you don't have that, then you don't have a great makerspace. Yes. You just yeah. have a, a nice tool work a tool rental shop. Yeah. Well and even um earlier this month I toured MHub, which is a commercial makerspace. They have hundreds of thousands of dollars of commercial sponsorships. They don't necessarily need to run on their member dues. A big part of their selling point, they they charge one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars for their lowest tier membership to just get in the door and use the tools a month. Their biggest selling point is come be part of our community, our our community of the best of the best and the most brilliant. It their selling point isn't their tool shop. It's not their prototyping lab and their sponsorships and, and everything else. That's a perk. But their selling point is the community. And mm-hmm. every yeah. other makerspace you go to, that's that's if they're not selling you on the community, it's probably not gonna last. So <laughs> Well, and that's how we we found something so valuable in our Slack channel that we even made just a membership tier just for that. Yes. Yeah. Because it, it is something that is so valuable to the community that we were like, no, people are actually interested in what we have to say and the people that we have at our makerspace to be able to help each other that, yeah, no, a, a separate membership tier just for this is something viable. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we've talked about this before, but, you know, um, um, being a part of makerspace, uh, like any, any old, you know, person can have a workshop at home or, you know, and, and work with tools but you are now setting yourself up with a nice little individual echo chamber of, you know, you're, you're only as good, I don't know, you only have as much experience and skills as you came into your own workshop with, and your projects are done when you feel like it's done. Right. Uh, but, but then you can look at that project and be like, that's pretty good. You know, I like how it came out. But, you know, if you're a part of Makerspace, you know, you could be like, well, how could I improve? Or somebody else will just voluntarily say, you know, here's how you can improve. And uh, well, and then you're, it's more of a, you get the more communal learning, um, sharing of experiences and skills that you wouldn't just get in your own home shop. You know? Right. Well, I can't tell you how many times I've come up with an idea and gone into the makerspace and just like sat down at a table and be like, what do you guys think of this? And then the, the yeah. idea completely changes over the next 20 minutes. And I love doing that. It's so much fun. And a lot of times I don't even make it. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, the conver- well, conversation just tickles me, though. And it's it's something that's so great about just having that community is it pushes you to do something better. Yes. Um, the, the infamous uh, beer cade that I continue to talk about that I unfortunately destroyed uh, and no longer is with us. Uh, was just that it was at one point I just wanted to make a cool arcade cabinet 
And then um, after that, somebody said, well, why, how can you make these things better? And so there was a theme that then got put on it. And I was like, well, I'm going to do this theme. And then somebody said, well, how can you make that even better? And then I was like, well, I can put a kegerator in it, I guess. <laughs> and it just like evolved into that. That was um, the best part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was so cool because I had so much of this unused space that I was like, well, let me find a way. And some of the members in the space were able to kind of push me to think about how can we do these other cool things? Um, and that's what has just made being a part of a maker space so great is this idea of members pushing each other to be creative and constantly improving their skills. Uh, and you really don't get that in your own little echo chamber at home. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's just, it's just more fun to make things with friends. Yeah. Like, yeah. When we started the makerspace, I had all the tools that the makerspace was going to have, but I didn't have anybody to make stuff with. It's, it's the saddest thing. Like, <laughs> I just wanted people. <laughs> I just wanted friends. I had friends, but none of my <laughs> friends would come to my workshop because I live in the middle of nowhere. So we made a workshop. So are you saying for uh, forty five dollars a month you can uh, buy your friends? Yes, and <laughs> I frequently they, when when I do talks about River City Labs, I frequently say in our first three years when the makerspace wasn't functional, people paid us purely to be our friends because that's all they got out of it. It honestly, that's pretty much why I'm sticking around. Yeah, like I never realized that there was like a an organization of people that were just like me. Yes. And here I thought I was a minority, you know, in our little central Illinois area. Yes. And now I found this, I found a group of people who are exactly like me and love, you know, tearing things apart and never putting them back together <laughs> and figuring out why things work and making things. I'm like, wow, th these are my people. Yeah. You know, I'll happily give you money each month just to hang out and talk and whatever. <laughs> well, and well, and I, that was like huge. Oh, I never, I never thought about that when when we were first putting the makerspace together. I always had the idea of antisocial nerds, and I'm one of them. I don't like people or <laughs> talking to people often, but you get enough people in the same room that have the same passions. You can't shut them up, no matter what their <laughs> social skills are. And I'm the same way. You get me talking yeah. about maker things, and then we start a podcast where people have to listen to us talk. It's 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 a thing. <laughs> Those people are the best, right? Thank well, and it's thanks. It's guys. something. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's something that's so cool because I I think for all three of us, we can actually say um, for the most part, the three of us actually don't use too many tools at the makerspace. Um, no, mainly uh, Joe, you have all of if not more tools at your own house and Aaron um, you've started to amass that at your house uh, I currently only have a 3D printer so I, I occasionally still do use the space a fair amount but it's become a little bit more to that to where I would say we have started to believe in more of what the makerspace could be and we support that dream rather than hey I need to use this space constantly um, and it's it's something that we want the makerspace to become a part of the community and be something better than it can be currently. Yes. Yeah. And that right now, most of, Oh, uh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Oh, most of my effort lately has been more in, you know, I'd rather make a better makerspace than actually make things for myself. Right. So that's kind of yeah. why I'm not burnt out yet as an officer. Cause I still have that passion to, you know, make a, if I can make an awesome makerspace where people make things that are awesome in it, then by uh, what is that? By the relative property, I make awesome things in the makerspace, right? Oh, uh, this transitive property, I make awesome things by creating this awesome, you know, makerspace where other people can make awesome things. Yeah, yeah, and that's been me for the last three years. Is uh, people ask me, "Well, what are you making right now?" I'm like, "Well, I've been working really hard on the makerspace." <laughs> <laughs> it's very meta to make a makerspace but um oh yeah yeah that it's a it's a very common theme in makerspace organizers like we don't actually work on projects very much because we're working so hard on making the space accommodating and useful for others and trying to contribute back to that community so but absolutely the i 
so reasons to join the makerspace if you already have good stuff the community is huge um but i think another thing is people very much limit themselves like well oh well i only do i only do 3d printing for my cosplay costumes it's like well but if you had a laser think about all the things you could do with a laser you know, we, yeah, when you we've brought this up before, but like when you have a hammer, the whole world looks like nails. And when you have a laser, yeah. the whole world looks like quarter inch Baltic birch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so true. But like when you have everything. You're not limited anymore. And mm. you know, a lot of people say like, well, I only know how to use the 3D. That's why you join a makerspace. Yeah, because we know how to use everything in the make sometimes i there's definitely tools in the makerspace that i have no idea how to use um and i'm not sure other people do either but we'll figure it out together <laughs> and that's half the fun yeah i love learning with people right um i love getting a new tool to space and we're all like how does this even work <laughs> and i make an effort to like be there with those people who are like figuring it out. Yeah. And then we all just kind of poke at it enough until we all learn as a group how the thing works. Yeah. We, we do the monkeys with sticks act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's part of the coolest thing was like the reason I got involved in the makerspace was because of a 3d printer class. And, um, that 3d printer class was held in, I believe January. Uh, and I didn't finish that printer until probably, I think the next January or February. <laughs> um, and because of the makerspace and because of all of that, that I was involved in, I was able to learn pretty much what every single piece of that 3d printer does and is trying to do. And it was only because I had people who were willing to walk alongside me and try and help me to get this thing to be built. Yeah. Um, and it was such a cool community for them to all rise around me and go, yeah, let's know, let, let's work on this together and let's actually get this thing done and you'll have a printer by the end of this. Um, and it's, it's given me not only maker knowledge that I've been able to kind of go on and, and work with in my normal day to day life, but also like, I real life and actual like engineering experience as well. Um, learning about like just different components and how they interact with each other and like, what are these things doing um, to where it's like some stuff in my job, I've been able to be like, Oh wait, no, these are l working exactly how my printer would work. Um, and I can relate that kind of stuff. So just having that community to, to work with you and always be around is, is uh, I would say, invaluable yeah. <laughs> um is probably Definitely. a good way to put it <laughs> well and you just brought up something too um we've had multiple members in our space get jobs and promotions purely because they're part of a makerspace yeah. yes they it, it, lots of people have gotten jobs because they were active in a makerspace yeah and i think that's huge like there are local companies now that look at our makerspace as a talent pool that they can pull from, which is yeah. awesome. Um, I, that says a lot about our membership, but it also says a lot about the maker community at large and what that can mean for people to join the maker community. Yeah, it was, it was super cool being able to like um, on my resume, I actually put, experience building a 3d printer and other tools part of a makerspace and uh they did ask for a certificate um from the makerspace which uh we were able to provide and um did you really I, yeah they actually did um this Where's is my ago. certificate <laughs> <laughs> we'll make you one. it was it was like a uh certificate of yes he completed this class and was part of these builds um, and w once they did, they, after I got past the interviews and all that kind of stuff, they legitimately did say that, that building that stuff and being a part of that community did play a role in you getting through these interviews and getting a little bit further ahead of some people. So awesome. it, it is an actual tool that people are starting to look at, including jobs. Oh yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. the last two promotions I had at cat, I think were purely based on my, makeriness and not my professional prowess yeah nice no, absolutely so did you guys have anything else to add we're we're hitting up on our 
our time mark that we normally try to hit for. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, good. I'm good. Well, um, I know a lot of makers are starting to listen to the podcast. Um, if you guys have things to add, reasons you joined the makerspace, even though you had a good workshop, or reasons that you're just love being part of your local makerspace, hit us up on our subreddit. It's uh, uh, makers on tap. Or hit us up on uh, Instagram again, Makers on Tap. And or if you have a great project you want to share, yeah, like you want to share your projects, pictures. send yeah. us pictures. We'll share your projects on the podcast so you can yeah. get some exposure. Um, if your project's super cool, we might even want to have you interview. Like that would be really awesome. Yeah, so that'd be um, great. Look forward to our next interview that we're going to be releasing this week. And uh, yeah, hit us up on the social medias, like we said. Uh, but with that, I think we're out. Yep. Keep uh, making stuff. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks. See you next week. Thanks, guys.